I'm going to be talking about anterior segment OCT. So the outline for my talk is basically a small introduction and the principle of ASOCT, the different types of machines available, why it should be your first investment soon in your own practice and the various different clinical applications and future devices and latest devices. Basically, OCT is a non-contact imaging technology that provides detailed cross-sectional images of the internal structures in the eyes. It helps in your diagnosis, surgical planning, and decision making, along with monitoring of the treatment. Based on the Michelson's in, in, interferometer, the principle of Michelson interferometer is to compare a partially coherent reference beam to another one from a reflected tissue. These are the various machines available. Some of them are time domain. As time has passed, we have shifted to spectral domains, and there are swift source OCTs in the form of Cassia available, which is the latest device. The advantage of an anterior segment OCT is its high spatial resolution. It's a non-contact device performed with the patient sitting up. Image acquisition is rapid and it can be viewed in time and recorded for monitoring purposes. Various scanning modes are for your various pathologies like an HD scan provides a scan through the same area and improves the resolution. Pathometric has a radial scan so that a diffuse area can be measured. Why should one invest in an OCT is because it helps in diagnosing your retinal conditions, your glaucoma, cornea, refractive surgery, and an anti-segment imaging. It's a revenue generating tool and aids in clinical diagnosis and management. So nowadays, these OCT machines have an anterior segment and a posterior segment built into one, like your Topcon or Spectralis. Let's come to the clinical application of anterior segment OCT in the pathologies. The most important issue that we need to assess is the cornea, where you can, you know, Find out scars, opacity, the graft assessment and pre and post-op planning, infectious keratitis, desmond membrane detachments, keratoconus, surface lesions like pterygium, limbal demoids, OSSN, and your dystrophies and degeneration. So how does a normal anterior segment OCT look like? There's basically a first layer of the tear film, which is a hyper-reflective layer, which overlies a band of a hypo-reflective layer, which is the normal corneal epithelium. And there is an underlying variable hyperreflectivity of the corneal stroma and the endothelium, which is a hyperreflective tissue. Coming to scars and opacity, like for example, in this case, if you could see there is a full thickness scar and then involvement of the endothelium also. So it's better to plan a posterior segment, how do you say, a penetrating graft than a full uh, endothelial keratoplasty or something like that. Depth of the stromal scar also helps in assessment and monitor and take treatment decisions wisely, whether you want to do a DALC or a superficial lamellar keratoplasty or a full thickness keratoplasty. For example, a case which was referred where there was a ballpoint cautery burned by a resident during SICS training. Uh, on ASOCT, we could see a deep stromal scarring and an endothelial involvement. So in this case, a preferably a penetrating keratoplasty would be better than a DALC in spite of you know, a very focal area of involvement. This patient was referred to me for a penetrating keratoplasty where the referring surgeon thought it was a full thickness stromal involvement. But on doing an ASOCT, you can clearly see that there is a superficial epithelial hyperplasia and this patient was therefore advised debridement and we had assessed him later. Some patients who have very thick corneas like a long-standing corneal edema, this shows diffuse scarring and there is no edema in this. This is mostly a scarred tissue. So therefore, this patient won't benefit from an endothelial keratoplasty. So basically in scar management, the superficial scars are treated with peeling and PTK and deeper lesions may be treated by keratoplasty. In your pre-op graft assessment, you have depth and extent of op opacities, thinning, retroconial membranes, panis, anterior segment abnormalities, and your failed grafts. In post-keratoplasty, after you have done your surgery, you can always check for graft host, opposition, pachymetry, interface problems, residual thickness, and in endothelial keratoplasty, you can look for detachments, dislocations, and apposition of the graft. The case where there is a spur on the posterior ledge. So this was actually a 6.5 to 7 mm optical keratoplasty done, which was eccentric in position. But looking at the posterior ledge, we decided not to do an endothelial keratoplasty in the form of DMAC or DSEC, and a PK was done for better visual outcome. The case of an apical scar in keratoconus where the apical scar was not involved in the deeper layer and therefore a manual DALC could be performed instead of a full thickness graft just based on the depth assessment. In DALC, you then, or any other graft, you just basically have to see for the pachymetry 
the graph clarity, the graph host junction, the decement membrane and the interface. In this, you can see there was a double bubble AC formed, but which resolved over time. The attachment of the graphs, you can see in an DSEC, you have an acute angle beveled sign where in the edge of the graph, there's an acute angle form. This is actually described as an intraoperative ASOCT by Dr. Narmadatta Sharma and all, but it can be used to assess the orientation in a hazy cornea post-op also. Monitoring of the grafts pre and post-op. On day one, if you see the graft is a very thick graft because of the long-standing edema and the storage medium involved. And over time, it resolves and the graft clarity improves and the pachymetry and graft thickness also reduces. Some, kind, some cases, they fail. So therefore, on a failed graft, the, redu the reduction of clarity, what do you say? Pachymetry and the clarity of the graft will not be seen. So you can easily monitor and assess. A new thing which was like done previously was an infectious keratitis, especially in cases where, you know, there is smear negative cultures and you want to objectively monitor the treatment response because you're going to give a cocktail therapy or you're based on your clinical judgment. So in this case, for example, this was a culture negative uh, case, which was responding to antifungal on presentation. It shows a corneal thickness and an infiltrate thickness, which we measured. And subsequently at third week and sixth week, when you keep measuring, the response to treatment is analyzed with the help of saying that the corneal thickness has reduced and the infiltrate thickness has also reduced and eventually turned into a scar. Based on this study which we had done, there was a recommendation made that the thickness of more than 230 micron should be taken as a red flag sign and other modalities of treatment should be added. In pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, you can check for scarring, thickness and area, areas of focal DM loss or tear. It helps you to decide what kind of keratoplasty you want to do or you want to still be on conservative management if it's in the initial stages. Like a pachymetry of 1000 won't help in endocheratoplasty. This case I had previously shown, this is a scarred cornea, not an edematous cornea. So an endothelial keratoplasty will not benefit. Pterygiums, OSS and limbal dermoids, you can keep assessing the surface regularity, the epithelialization. In OSS and you can clearly see that there is a specific sign where there is a hyperreflective epithelium and an abrupt transition zone from normal to abnormal epithelium. This is a pre and post treatment photograph where treatment response to the medical management in the form of interferons is seen. No need for surgical intervention as of now in this case. Dermoids, the extent of the dermoid and the deeper involvements. Another very important thing to see is your desmond membrane detachment cases. There are various algorithms and classifications based on OACT. So in desmond membrane detachment, uh, it is important to see the post tamponade pachymetry and attachment and clarity of the graft. So based on OCT, there is a class, there is a treatment protocol made where depending on the local configuration, just one minute more, you can use the type of tamponade agent and show how it is done. You can see the pre and post-op pictures after treatment. Then you have your corneal dystrophies. Basically in dystrophies, more than diagnosing them, if you can see there are various levels of involvement and there are various features on ASOCT, you can always uh, determine whether you want to do a PTK or PRK based on the depth of involvement. Intrastromal foreign bodies, exact depth and area can be seen. The back shadow actually here mimics a perforation, but this is not a perforation. This, this is an artifact, if you can go. And there is tear film assessment where you can see the tear film height which is reduced in dry eye cases. In refractive surgeries, you can do epithelial uh, assessment, flap assessment, smile cases, and if you want to do retreatments based on the depth of the flap. These are the characteristic planar and meniscus flap of the LASIK flaps. There is something called as interface fluid syndrome, which can be detected and monitored over time during treatment. Retained smile lenticle, which can be manually removed based on the extent and depth of the involvement. You can see your demarcation line, just 30 seconds. A lot of pachymetric parameters, epithelial mapping you can do, but most importantly to be seen is a cross-linking of the stromal demarcation line. Intacts also help whether you want to monitor post-operatively with decompensation, migration, and perforations. Then you come to fakic IL where you need to see for the vaulting and the shallowing of the angles and positioning. In cataract surgery, you can see your phaco wound architecture something like a capsular distension syndrome where there is fluid behind the IOL. And in glaucoma angle assessment, you can see the virtual biopsy of the plateau iris pachymetry for IOP. You 
can see the pictures is narrowing of the angles, some post-op pictures, plateau iris configuration, reverse pupillary blocks, the various angle opening distances and measurements which you can do for objective assessment, bleb characteristics, and also other associated patterns. Newer devices are anterior, which is basically a biometer, topographer, and an ASOCT. If you can see in this application, there is the sky is the limit. You can do everything in this one scan, one machine. There's a future of Cassia where there is, you know, 3D imaging reconstruction also, which can be done. So basically, in summary, OCT is applicable to assess a wide variety of corneal and anti-segment conditions, revolutionize the ability to examine the anterior chamber cornea and surrounding areas. Thank you.